All right, cool. Well, I guess we'll get started. It's already 1.50. I think that's when I'm supposed to start. All right, cool. So I'm Patrick, and we're going to talk about RAF today, which is a distributed consensus protocol. So uh, I'm Vansty pretty much everywhere on the internet, and I work at Big Nerd Ranch. Um, you might know us from our books. We do some like iOS and Android books. Uh, but we also teach courses and do consulting. Um, I, wrote, I write Ruby there on the products team, so we also have our own products. Um, but first, before we get into anything too technical, uh, I want to go through like a really human, normal example of consensus that you all might have done. We actually, it's funny enough, we actually did this this morning over Twitter, trying to find coffee. Um, so there's four friends, Matt, Amy, Kim, and Dan. Uh, they all live in Atlanta, and every Friday morning they uh, text message each other to try to find out where they're going to go for coffee. Um, so Matt wakes up first, Friday morning. Uh, he asks everyone else where they want to go for coffee, um, if they're awake and everything. Um, Amy and Kim are, want to go, and they're like, yeah, let's go. Uh, but Dan is still asleep and hasn't responded yet. So Matt suggests Octane, which is one of my favorite coffee shops in Atlanta. And uh, Dan's still asleep, uh, doesn't get the message. <coughs> Amy and Kim are like, yeah, we'll meet you there. And uh, yeah, again, Dan, nothing. <laughs> um, but then Dan wakes up uh, and frantically wants coffee, and so he doesn't look at his, uh, his phone at all, and uh, he just sends out a message to everyone. He's like, okay, I need coffee right now. Uh, but Matt's already like, oh, well, we already made a decision. We're going to Octane. You can meet us there. So uh, pretty normal you know, coffee situation, or you know, if you've tried to schedule beer with other people, it's pretty normal. Um, but if we really tried to like, break it down into like, different concepts of like, what just happened, um, I guess we could say that we did kind of a form of leader election where Matt uh, kind of initiated the conversation, handled who was going, and uh, kind of made the decisions on when they were going to go. We also, it's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of weird to talk about with people, but we did state replication, I guess. <laughs> uh, you know, Matt made a decision, and then uh, everyone else you know, heard about it and stored it in their brain. <laughs> uh, and we also, I mean, this is, this is silly too, but we had, we had a partition, right? Like, uh, Dan was asleep, didn't really hear what was going on, but when he woke up, everything was fine, and he kind of, he got up to speed without any problems. Um, so, and that's, I mean, that's pretty even, it's even easy to talk about some of these concepts related to humans, but um, if you were to, like, write an algorithm for it and, like, cover all of those steps and all of the edge cases, it gets like really, really complicated, and it's really difficult. So, um, and it, it really comes down to like uh, humans are just way better at consensus than computers. Uh, I think other people have even said that uh, computers really only do what you tell them to do at this conference, and that, that's, I mean, everyone kind of knows that. But uh, it's just it, it's hard because we have to tell them exactly all of these cases to handle. Uh, so that's why consensus is hard. Uh, but why am I talking about this at RubyConf? This, there's not a ton of Ruby in this talk. Um, but I think it's knowing some of these distributed computing algorithms is really uh, important. Um, and a lot of Ruby people uh, deal with the internet or the web in some way. And so uh, here's something to think about. Um, so do you have uh, multiple database servers uh, in, in your service or app? Um, well, obviously, that's going to be a distributed system. I think most people realize that or you know, would classify that as a distributed system. Uh, what, what if you have multiple app servers? So what if, you're, what if you have two dynos on Heroku? Well, that's also distributed. Um, you might not have thought about that before, but it's kind of considered distributed. It might not be super interesting either, but you still have some of those problems. Um, what about uh, multiple clients? So if you have a web app, you probably have multiple clients, right? Because clients can even be browsers. Um, and so it's probably a super boring, not very interesting distributed system, but that's also distributed as well. Um, so it's really good to know about some of these problems. Um, and I mean, the main thing is, if you're writing web apps, you're really building boring, but they're still distributed systems. So it's good to think about some of these problems um, and just know where the boundaries are, where you're going to, I don't know, it's good to know what problems can come up and what solutions are available to solve them. So, um, so let's get into Raft. Uh, which is, uh, like I said, is a consensus protocol. So we're going to go through a bunch of examples and stuff. Um, but 
Uh, it was written by Diego Angario and uh, John Osterhout. Uh, they both work at Stanford. Uh, they wrote the paper together. Uh, Diego's a super nice guy. You should ping him on Twitter if you have any questions or anything. Um, uh, and before we do some really in-depth stuff, I just want to do a quick definition of what consensus is. Uh, and it's really just agreeing upon state across distributed processes, even in the presence of failures. So we have a bunch of servers. Uh, we want them to agree on a certain decision or value. And we want them to be able to do that without all of the servers having to be up or available. Um, so if a couple of them are down, we still want the uh, consensus to be possible. And uh, when should you use it? Um, some common examples are if you need a distributed lock. So if you're like trying to, uh, if, you, if, you can, if you're the only person trying to write to a file or uh, something like that, you would use it. Also, a lot of people use it for distributed configuration. So if you have a lot of servers that are sharing configuration information, you would want to use it. Um, and an interesting one, too, would, that you could do would be uh, storing your background jobs in some kind of uh, distributed store, uh, where you could you know, write those jobs to to that uh, database or whatever, and then use um, consensus to pull them out and acquire a lock on them or something. Um, and for the people who know what Paxos is, uh, and if you don't know what it is, it's it's like an older consensus algorithm uh, from the from the late 80s. And there's a reason I'm not giving a talk on Paxos. Um, well, one because it's kind of older, but um, it's it's still really good, right? Um, like a lot of Raft is founded on this, but as uh, systems developers and as actually just as software developers in general, it's actually really hard to understand. Uh, I've actually tried to build some stuff with Paxos before, and if you just read the first paper, it's really hard to get anywhere. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of missing pieces. They're not really missing. They're just it wasn't really a part of the initial protocol. Um, so you have to read a bunch of other papers, and then there's like conflicting decisions on which on what you want to make. And if you start implementing Paxos, you really end up implementing something else usually. Um, and so Raft kind of fixes that by taking a systems approach to uh, creating a consensus algorithm. So uh, let's lay some groundwork and get into some examples. So um, all of my slides, the circles are nodes, and they all kind of have this configuration. So they all have a, a log which holds uh, different entries in it, and they're in a specific order. Uh, and these are things like uh, if you send a client request to a server, they're going to store that in the log. There's also a consensus module, which handles the logic and uh, stores the state for who's the leader and who can do what and who should we listen to. And there's also a state machine. And I'm not really going to talk too much about the state machine. Um, just know that if you, if you don't know what a state machine is, I guess, um, it's, like, it's something where you, you give it an input, and it's always going to give you back an output that you expect. So this could even be like a Ruby program. And Raft kind of lets this be pluggable. So you could write your own little Ruby uh, business logic module to plug into the state machine part that just knows how to respond to the, the client commands you store in the log. So you don't have to worry too much about that. Just know that client commands get run through it. So uh, a basic cluster. Um, this one has three nodes. Um, and typically, there's just one leader for the cluster. And everyone else is a follower. That's kind of the normal operation. Um, and the way things happen is a client talks to the leader, uh, and the leader decides to send out what the client gave it to everyone else, kind of replicates the state out. Um, and then everyone runs that client command on their local state machine. So everyone has a copy of that, an identical copy of that state machine. The client commands get sent out, and then they just run that locally. So we're not sending like um, state around, we're just sending these, cl these client commands. And so, I mean, this is kind of, this is super basic, right? Like, we haven't talked at all about, like, what happens if the leader fails or anything like that? Um, like, how do we maintain order of the log? So Raft kind of splits, uh, splits up those three problems into three different sections. Uh, and so first, we're going to talk about leader election, which is, like, the, ma the major, one major part. So nodes can have uh, one of three roles. And this is kind of how I'm going to just discuss how you kind of move in between these roles. Uh, basically how you become a leader from being a follower. So everyone starts out as a follower, uh, and like when you bring the cluster up. And if they haven't heard from a leader in a while, they get suspicious, and they decide to start their own election to become leader. Uh, so at that point, if they haven't heard from a leader in a while, they expect them to be down or just 
lost somewhere, uh, and they become a candidate. Uh, and so once they become a candidate, they've started an election, they're trying to get people to vote for them. So one of three things can happen. Uh, they can either uh, win the election, which in that case they'd become the leader. And the way you win an election is you, you've been, you, when you become a candidate, you send out a request for votes, and if you get a majority of votes, so a majority of the other nodes in the cluster say that you can become leader, you do. Um, now, if, there's another case where if, if you only get like a third of the votes or something, or let, like let's say three candidates try to become leader at the same time, um, you're gonna have a split vote. Uh, and so if that happens, you basically just restart the election. Um, so you kind of wait for enough votes to come in, and if you don't get them in time, then you just try again. Um, you, you would just do that indefinitely. Um, and then obviously there's a third option, um, and that's if someone else has beat you, right? Uh, if you lose the election, you'll, that leader will uh, tell you, basically, and then you'll step back down to a follower. Uh, and, then so, and then, so if we became leader, um, there's also the case where we are garbage collecting for three minutes or something, and uh, everyone else thinks we've died or crashed, and uh, someone else will become leader and kind of uh, replace us. So we have to worry about that case as well. And in that case, you just become a follower again. Uh, and so we've talked about kind of how the servers communicate with each other while they're changing state. Uh, and so there's two major ways to communicate. You can see that you know, the candidates have to ask people for votes and the leaders have to tell people that they're leaders. Um, so there's, two, there's only two remote procedure calls that we need to make. Uh, so there's only two ways that these servers are gonna be talking to each other. Uh, and the first one is request vote, which is exactly what you would expect it to be. Uh, it's a candidate asking for people to vote for them. Uh, and so they would, they would just send that out when they become a candidate to all of the followers. Uh, and if they respond successfully, that is a vote that they got. Uh, now, append entries is, might sound like it's named kind of weird. Um, in the previous, the previous slides, we were kind of talking about it as the leader notifying all of the other people that it was leader. Uh, but this is also used, it's kind of overloaded. Um, it's also used for the leader replicating out those log entries. So the leader gets a client command uh, and the way they send it to all of the followers is they use append entries. Um, I'll show an example of what that actually looks like on a further slide. Um, but we also, um, we also talked about, uh, oh yeah, and I guess if, if they haven't gotten a request from the client in a while, um, they'll also send out an empty append entries call. And so that's kind of like a heartbeat that they'll be sending, um, just so the, none of the followers try to become leader in the meantime. Okay, so, and we talked about how the leader can find out that there's a new leader. Well, how do we know which one's newer or older, right? Um, so, Raft kind of uh, gives, us the, gives us this thing called a term, and it's really just a replacement for, like, a wall clock. So, instead of using, like, a timestamp or something to know who is the most current leader, um, we use this number that we increment. Uh, and the, the diagram here just shows... Uh, every time there's a new election, uh, before when a follower becomes a candidate, they just increment their term number. And so um, they would, if they won the election, they would become leader for that term. And so you can use that number. If you're, let's say if you're, uh, a, if you're a leader and someone says that they're a leader and they have a higher term, that means that they are the most current leader. So you would step down. So you can use that to kind of, you can also use that to make sure that you're not voting for more than one person per term, uh, so you're not, you don't have, um, so p one person wins an election. Um, but it's really just to, just used to make sure that uh, you're talking to the right people and, you're not, and you can ignore old requests from people that recently came back. So uh, let's get into um, how an election actually works in the cluster. So everyone starts out as a follower, uh, and then let's just say that the top guy times out because he hasn't heard from a leader in a while. Um, so, times out, becomes a candidate. This is when he would uh, increment his term number as well. Uh, and immediately votes for himself. So he already has one vote out of three, um, which I don't know, makes sense. And uh, then he would send out request votes to everyone else. And then uh, let's just say that this follower over here responds with, with success, but the other follower on the other side, we, we don't know what happened to him, but he, he just never responded. Um, and that's okay, because we already got two out of three votes. We can, uh, we can say that we're leader and everything's fine. So that's really leader election. 
let's move on to log, log replication. Um, and let me, let me go through what the logs actually look like. So we've kind of, I've kind of uh, hand waved over that for a little while. Uh, so this would be an example of what uh, a log on a leader and a log on a follower would look like. So, um, so these are these client commands almost like Redis style commands here where we're setting, we're just kind of setting x equal to one, y equal to two. Um, so that's, that's what that looks like, but that's not really the important part. The important part here is the, the numbers on the very top are the index for the log, and the numbers in the squares are the term numbers. So for, this, for the first term, there were three client requests, and then someone became a, lead, a new leader uh, for the second term. Uh, and the reason those are important is because you can uniquely identify each one of these slots by the index and the term number. So if, ever, if we ever see uh, you know, index two, term one, we know that that command is gonna be there. Now the reason that um, some of these are blue and then like the last one is still uh, tan uh, is there's a notion of uh, a client command or a log entry being committed. Um, so when a, when, a, or when a leader initially gets a request from the client, they're gonna store that in their log immediately, but they don't actually run it through the state machine. Um, and that's really important because we have to wait for all of the other servers to have that entry before we run it through and uh, uh, actually commit it. Um, and we also wanna make sure that they're always in the same order too. So uh, we have to make sure that everyone has the same log before we actually are committing these entries along. So let's look, let's look at what one of these uh, append entries example, or just one of these commands would actually look like. So we have the entries like you would expect. Um, in this one, we have uh, index four and we're just setting x equal to four. Uh, and also, this is the first term, which we've seen that before. And uh, another interesting thing here is there's a, um, the leader commit is the commit index. So that's how a leader tells followers and other people to commit these entries, to run them through their same machine and make sure that we're applying those. Uh, and I'll talk about this previous log uh, piece in a minute, but really it just means that you want it's a consistency check to make sure that we have the previous entry. Since that's it, you can uniquely identify the previous entry by the term and the index. Um, so here's an example of running that append entries call on a log. So first, we have three entries uh, all in the first term, uh, x equals one, y equals two, z equals three. Uh, and the third, the, the entry in the third index is not committed yet. Uh, so after we run, after we run this append entries example, uh, which is saying it has leader commit three, and it also is giving us the fourth entry, set x equals to four for the first term. So we're gonna commit three and then add four. So uh, pretty, pretty simple, but it's, it's good to see the example. You can kind of see it in action. So, and really the takeaway here is Log entries are always committed in the same order, and after we commit them, even if, even if the leader commits it and then can't actually tell anyone because it crashes, we, we, always, uh, we can never uncommit it, right? So once it's committed, it has to always be committed. Otherwise, we would have inconsistencies in our cluster and it wouldn't be consensus at all. Um, so this might be hard to see, so let's go through some actual examples. So this is the happy path case of what would normally happen without any crazy problems. So, Start out with the leader, two followers, um, nothing in the logs yet. Uh, we get a client request with a star, and the, when the leader gets it, it, it immediately puts it in its log. But now, just keep in mind, that's not actually committed yet. That's in the log. It wouldn't be blue, it's still uh, tan. So, uh, so the next step, the leader replicates it out to the followers. Uh, they store it in their log as well, still not committed. Um, and they respond back to the leader. Uh, and once the leader gets a majority of successful responses and it knows that it's in a majority of the followers logs, it can then go ahead and commit it and immediately respond to the client. Um, so at that point, if you were making the request from like a Ruby program or something, you would get the response and be able to do whatever with it. Um, and then the next step would be the leader would um, increment that uh, commit index and the followers would know that they can commit it as well and run it through their state machine. So. That's, the, uh, that's what should normally happen. That's the uh, good example of how this works. Um, but it's kind of cool to see some failure cases and how it's handled and wrapped. So, so same thing, we start out with a leader, two followers, empty indexes everywhere, uh, and the leader gets the client request again, the star. Um, but right after it gets that client request, 
we have a network partition. So the leader can, can no longer talk to the followers at all. It tries to, doesn't get a response back. Um, in the meantime, the followers are like, well, we haven't really heard from the leader in a while, so I guess um, one of us will become leader. So I'm kind of skipping over that, uh, the actual um, leader election part there, because we've already seen that. <coughs> And then so uh, once one of them become leader, becomes leader, the client starts talking to them, and that leader gets a new entry, which I'm just representing as a circle. And, but, but keep in mind, we still have that star up there in the first one. So um, it seems like it's conflicting yet, but since neither of them are committed yet, we can still keep moving. Um, so that leader uh, then replicates it to that follower. It can't replicate it to the leader yet because it's still partitioned there. Uh, but the leader has heard back from a majority of the, of the, the majority of the servers and can then commit it. Um, and so that, that's, that's awesome, but we still, this leader up here still has an old record in it. Um, and let's say that at this point the partition is resolved and that leader is then like, hey guys, uh, you need to replicate this star entry. Well, when this, uh, when this server on the bottom right became leader, it incremented its term number. So when the, leader up top, the old leader up top tries to send the star down, they're going to be like, oh, you're an old leader. Um, we're not listening to you. And they're going to tell them about the new uh, circle one that they got. So that was, kind of, that was a basic, uh, basic example of how that leader got um, replaced and how everything kind of kept moving forward. Uh, but there's an even worse example that we can talk about, which is uh, kind of crazy. Um, so same thing. Start out with the leader. Uh, we have two followers. Uh, we get that client request again, the star, uh, put that in there. And this time, uh, a different server gets partitioned off. This follower over here uh, doesn't actually get the star, uh, star command, can't put it in its log. Um, but this guy over here gets it, and he successfully responds, like, hey, we, we got it. You can go ahead and commit it. They respond to the client. The client knows that it's been committed. Um, so at this point, we can't uncommit that entry or anything. Um, and right after, the leader responds to the client, and before it can tell everyone else that it's committed, we get another partition. So at this point, the, the leader's committed it, it's run it through its state machine, the client thinks that it's committed, but the, uh, the other servers in the uh, cluster don't know that it's committed and haven't run it through their state machine yet. Um, this is sort of a problem, right? And it's, we, we want to make sure that we're always committing the, the same entries everywhere. Um, so. Uh, at this point, the followers are like, hey, we haven't heard from the leader in a while. Um, we, uh, I don't know, we, we don't know what to do, so one of us is going to become leader. But what if the server on the right-hand side becomes leader? Um, that would be a huge problem, right? Because it doesn't have that entry. So it would become leader and would potentially be able to commit entries into that, that first slot there, which would conflict with what we already know is, uh, is that star. So... Raft, Raft solves this. Um, we, there's ways to guard against losing these log entries. Um, and, and I guess in the paper they call this safety. It's this whole section at the end. Um, and it really comes down to two major rules. Uh, so we can only cast votes for nodes, uh, oh sorry, we can only cast votes for nodes uh, with logs that contain at least as many entries as our own. So if we go back to this example, um, when that follower over there on the right tried to become leader, this follower would not vote for him because it has more entries in his log. Uh, so, so eventually both of them would time out and both of them would, would try to become candidates, but this follower on the left would always get the vote because it has more entries. Um, so that's how we, we handle that problem. Um, but even then, once that follower becomes leader, uh, it's still not gonna have that entry committed at the bottom. Um, and so the way we handle that uh, is with the second part of safety. And that's new leaders must commit a log entry from their term before committing old entries. So they need to make sure that they can uh, commit their own entries before they are trying to commit entries from an old leader. Um, and that just, it prevents uh, entries from being committed if they weren't supposed to be. So let's say the leader only replicated it to one other node in like a 10 node cluster. It shouldn't be uh, committed because they didn't have consensus on replicating that log entry. Uh, so those are the two uh, safety situations, and that really covers everything that keeps everything consistent. Um, there are a few more things that the paper talks about uh, that I, pr I probably don't have time to go over, um, but there are 
basically ways to, everything we've done so far is really just with you know, one cluster that doesn't change. So if we wanted to add new nodes or um, just change things at all, um, they, they go through a way to do that without, um, without potentially having more than one leader or anything like that. Um, so check that out in the paper. They do a really good job explaining it. There's also, they also explain how to do log compaction. If you're, you don't want, if you're running your, your, uh, your cluster for like more than a year, you don't want to have to be storing all those commands in a crazy log. Um, so they, they have some really good ways of doing that as well, kind of cleaning up after yourself. Um, and they also, they recently added client uh, specifics. So you, they show you how to implement the client um, and guard against certain things, like if your request times out, uh, being able to retry it without having you know, duplicate entries and stuff like that. Um, so it's pretty cool. You should check it out. So again, why, uh, why give this at RubyConf? Um, and I, I, thought it, I thought it was pretty interesting. I looked on GitHub yesterday, and there are over 10 Ruby implementations of Raft already. That's, I don't, I'm not really sure why there's so many JavaScript ones. That seems kind of weird to me. But there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of Ruby ones. And uh, I, I thought, it, I, I don't know, I just thought it was really cool that a bunch of Rubyists are taking Raft and trying to implement it on their own. Because there's not that many. I mean, if you look for Paxos implementations, there's not that many. And so it's kind of interesting to me. Um, and I really think it's, it comes down to Ruby is just really good at expressing problems. Uh, and it, it just, your logic is really readable, um, and it, it just makes dealing with these really hard problems kind of fun. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, and I, I really enjoy it. But uh, the problem is, I, I do, and I still don't really know why. Uh, I think it might have just been an accident, but it seems like the academic community doesn't really like to program in Ruby. Um, I even, in college, I would write some things in Ruby, and people would be like, oh, well, you should, you should rewrite that in Python. And I'm like, well, why would I, I mean, it's not, it's not that much different, um, but people just like Python better and other languages as well. Um, and I think, I think it comes down to three major things that we can kind of uh, identify, I guess. Um, so the first one is the community. So the Ruby and the academic communities don't overlap very much. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not either one's fault. We just don't have a lot of uh, communication channels to talk about things. Um, so, I would definitely, uh, I have, on my next slide, I have some examples of what we can do to, to fix that. But uh, I don't know. I just think that those communities should be able to talk a lot better. Um, the next one is understandability. I think Rubyists really, uh, really like to be able to understand things easily. Uh, like, that's why we have those blog posts that spec everything out, and it's really simple. Uh, but I, and I think this is changing in the academic world. Uh, but the problem is a lot of the people who write uh, who you know are successful in the academic world write papers so that other people can reference those papers and so they have to be like super groundbreaking discoveries and stuff and a lot of the time someone coming in maybe it's their like third paper they've read they're they're never going to be able to understand it because they have to read like 15 other papers to you know get through the first paragraph uh, but this is changing so the, the raft paper is awesome and they, they actually I, I think they specifically didn't do that reference craziness um, just to make it more more easy to understand. And at the end, they even have a whole section on how they taught everyone Paxos and they taught everyone Raft and did like an analysis of which one was more understandable. So it's, it's really cool. You should check it out. Um, but yeah, this is, under, this is changing in the academic community, but um, it's still something you have to deal with if you're trying to get involved. And the third one is learning material. There's, uh, there's not a lot of ways to really, I mean, like I said, you have to read all these papers just to get a basic understanding of previous topics before you can move on. Uh, so and I, think, and I don't think this is just the academic community's fault or anything. I think the problem is, like, once Rubyists or other people read these papers, they should just write a blog post on it or, you know, just share it with people uh, in a kind of condensed format. Uh, so more, more stuff like that would be awesome. So if you want to help out and try to merge these two communities, just get more involved in the academic community, have them know more about Ruby, uh, go read a bunch of papers. There's, there's actually some really good ones. Uh, if you've never read a, a white paper before, um, you know, go on Google Scholar or something and uh, type in a topic that you're super interested in. Check out a paper. You could also just look for, uh, or you could start with a RAF paper, or even just look for like top computer science papers of 2012 or something like that. Um, and and go to conferences. I mean, it's awesome that you guys are here at RubyConf. This is a great conference. Uh, if you're looking for any other kind of conferences to go to, there are also uh, industrial tracks at a lot of academic conferences. And those are really for, um, they, they have all the new papers and everything that people have submitted and people talking about that, but they also have 
people from the industry who have tried to implement these new algorithms and stuff, um, talking about the problems they had. And um, it's really just kind of a it's good conversation back and forth. It's good feedback for uh, the people who are writing these papers so they can deal with those problems in the future. Um, and also talk to people. Just you know, ping these people on Twitter. Like they're, they're super nice people, and they want to hear from you. If, you're, if you enjoy their papers or the work that they're researching, they, they want to know about it. So even though they're in a different kind of academic community, go, go talk to them and tell them that you wrote this thing in Ruby, and it's awesome. Uh, so that's my advice to you. Um, there's also some other, uh, other stuff you can do. Um, the raft paper is great. I'd recommend reading it. Uh, it's a pretty quick read, too. Uh, there's also a bunch of raft implementations that you can check out. Uh, and the raft also has a new website up on GitHub if you want, if you want to look at it. Uh, there's Think Distributed is a podcast that some guys at Basho did, and their first episode was on Raft. If you want like a uh, really in-depth study, and uh, Diego even answers some questions and stuff. He, Diego also gave a talk at RyCon, uh, I think last week. Uh, it's not in its own video yet, but you can check it out on the live feed that they recorded. Uh, and yeah, and check out Google Scholar. There's some other cool websites to check out papers, uh, stuff like that. So, so that's. Uh, I guess it's time for questions. But. All right, well, I guess that's it. Thanks so much, guys.